この時間のインタビューだとあんまり取れてないと思いますけどよろしくお願いします。Yeah, so we're excited so early in the day.、Um, with this being the first interview slot, you may or may not have had enough time to get your hands on the demo play today. But yeah,、uh, we're here to answer any questions you may have. So, the first question I have、um, I noticed last media tour there was a good amount of PvP, but in this media tour, no PvP.、Oh, yeah. And it's、uh, grayed out.、Um, Could players expect that PvP will have something at the beginning of Shadowbringers, or will it be something that's changed in 5.1? If any major, cha- major changes, I guess.、Um, of course, in terms of adjustments to the balance, we will be applying those updates. So, with PvP, the reason why we haven't sort of focused in on PvP is that, as you can see, there's a lot of updates that are being made to the battle system itself. And if we were to add the PvP on top of that, it would be just an overwhelming amount of information. And so, of course, we have made updates to some of the actions that are involved in PvP, but、uh, content wise, updates will start coming in at 5.1 time. We wanted to sort of focus more on PvE for the time being. So, at 5.1, we do plan to update Frontline, which we haven't sort of、um, touched upon in a while. We want to say it's a new role. Maybe it's not necessarily a new role, but you can expect one of the more popular sort of game role within Frontlines is going to get an update. So, we will be revealing information when it becomes available. Okay. So, on the topic of PVE content coming in 5.0, I was curious as to the plans that you guys have for unsinking old Ultimate fights and what you guys plan on doing about that. If you're going to allow that to happen or if you're just going to, I guess, make it still kind of an achievement later on. Um, so, in terms of ultimate content, we don't have any plans to make changes to it.、Um, and so, we don't have plans to raise that minimum item level, nor will we be removing that sort of unsinking. And so, the value of the titles or the weapons associated with that will be sort of maintained. And in terms of ultimate, we are making plans for the next sort of ultimate content as well. So, we will、okay. be revealing information when it becomes available. Okay. To go further into PvE, a lot of players realize、uh, Varays with Red Mages is extremely powerful, especially in progression going into raids, because you can raise very easily at very little cost. Do we think that、uh, we will change that at some point? Because a lot of players really enjoyed the restrictions with、uh, Baldessian Arsenal, where you couldn't raise、yeah. much. And so maybe for Savage or Ultimate, will we see those kind of、uh, changes?、Mm-hmm. First and foremost, we want to avoid a situation where we're taking away something that you can do. We don't want to have, potentially have a negative experience、um, for our players to have something available and then have that taken away from them or be very restricted in using that skill. So, with the Red Mage,、um, just as a general characteristic of how to play Red Mage, is that it's very easy to ground,、um, very accessible、um, in terms of the control and its. Something that you can quickly pick up, and plus, you have your healing spells, you do have your、um, raising spells, and so that's the sort of characteristic of the, the red mage. And so, we want to avoid sort of taking away from that sort of characteristic of the, the red mage, and so that's the first part of the, the reason. And in terms of adding restrictions to raising your party members. In terms of applying that to a savage content, it's definitely a no go.、Um, we don't have any plans of doing that. But with the ultimate battles, it might depend on future plannings and how we、um, approach future content、uh, of that series. But I mean, <laughs> in an eight person party, it's, we're worried that there'd be more backlash than anything else. But in any case, having a magic DPS or caster have the capability of raising your party members was something that was a topic of debate.、Um, of course, with the summoner and red mage having that capability will allow for healers to sort of let them handle、um, the raising. And it's a very convenient way of sharing that responsibility. But it also brings the issue of having healers sort of let the casters handle raising your party members and then the healer. 
particular would utilize the leftover MP to make attacks. And that was a point of debate that we wanted to sort of make sure to hash out because it would be potentially problematic. So with the discussion that we had amongst the development team, of course, there were ideas brought up for the casters, uh, the summoner and red mage raise capabilities to be more uh, coming at a larger cost or having some kind of penalty um, put upon it. But then they also considered if we were to do that, the healers would then see it as a negative and that they don't want uh, your casters to, to raise party members with some weird debuff associated with it. And so it just the debate continued on and, and we were questioning, so what, what exactly is the function of raising your party members and whatnot? And after a lot of debate and back and forth, we made the decision to not um, touch it at this point. So I've only been able to get my hands on a few classes for the demo so far, but something I've noticed is instead of making certain classes weaker, you've you've seemed to take the bottom classes and bring them up, and I'm wondering if that was a conscious design choice on you guys' part. Um, yes, it's definitely deliberate. Of course, the development team members are also players of Final Fantasy XIV, and we never want to nerf. Any particular <laughs> element, um, rather than taking something that's excelling above the others and nerfing it, we would rather take that sort of bottom and bring it up. And we were we we're hoping that that kind of adjustment is also um, something that the players would be happy about. Oh, definitely. Well, so. yes. <laughs> Um, but that being said, there were certain mechanics that we realized was extraordinarily high that we needed to sort of balance out. And of course, we didn't want to remove it altogether. We wanted to make it so that it would add perhaps like another step that would allow for it to be a little bit more balanced than the, the other ones. So, of course, there are certain elements that we had to sort of make adjustments to um, on a downward scale, but I'm sure you'll you'll find that out as the game comes out and you try out the different jobs. Um, but those adjustments that we made on a sort of downward scale, just understand that the development team deliberated thought uh, hard and it was not an easy choice to make some of those uh, downward adjustments. Right? Okay. Um, so I am, uh, I work with the world race quite a bit. I talk with a lot of players, I follow it and I track it and I, that's part of my role in the community. Uh, one thing that I'm curious about, I know that the achievements, they all say, uh, like, May 25th, 2019. Could it say May 25th, 2019, 5.30 p.m.? Oh. Like a time? <laughs> so, it's technically possible, but it, the, the clock, are, it's the server's timestamp. So it might not necessarily be like truly accurate. It's like, do we record it on a sort of standardized world time? Based on how uh, things are programmed, anything that requires processing of time or a sort of clock mechanic into it is delicate because if the clock is messed up. It, it affects the program that processes like displaying time and whatnot. So programmers are not keen on including it as part of their code. But I mean, it's worth asking to see what, what they think about it. So he, um, Yoshida, will, will see, uh, will ask. Thank you. So back on the topic of ultimate fights, for the coming ultimate fights of Shadowbringers, I'm wondering if you guys have decided whether or not there will or will not be three throughout the entire expansion and um, on that decision, I'm wondering what you base the decisions off of. So you may or may not be aware, but uh, when we plan for content, uh, we don't plan it with each coming patch. Like it's not as immediate as, okay, what do we do with our next patch? Right, right. It's more about having roadmap for about two years worth of content. Um, so we plan very far in advance, and that's only because it would help determine how we pace ourselves. We are pumping out content in a fairly systematic sort of plan, and, and we have that sort of set schedule. So we have to think in advance and sort of pace ourselves. For example, we had the Blue Mage limited job incorporated, but that required for us to allocate time that we would take to uh, develop about two patches, or actually three patches. So we have to sort of know what we're, we're doing fairly early in advance, or else we wouldn't be able to execute according to that schedule and still continue to have that constant updates. So in terms of the 5.x series, we were actually already going to have a roadmap decided upon by the end of June. 
On a side note, in terms of planning for the next expansion, it usually starts around the end of August of an expansion release year. So we're already thinking about design ideas for the next expansion. So we, it is, again, a very long-term sort of planning. Um, but yeah, we just wanted to give you that context first. Okay. So in terms of ultimate battles, or actually with any sort of content throughout the 5.x series, including uh, the casual content, the alliance raid, eight-man raid, including the ultimate, all of that different content that goes into the game is going to sort of fall into place, or we're going to make the schedule for that at that end of June timing. Um, and then that's when we sort of determine how many times we're going to have our ultimate battles pan out. And at the same time, we also talk about how we want to, or where we want to take the ultimate battle. Do, do we sort of continue in this, or do we start thinking about new ideas and things like that? In Stormblood, in the ultimate battles that were planned for um, that series, until right before the release of the content, our plan was, okay, we want to do it at patch 4.1, patch 4.3, and patch 4.5. The plan, of course, was to have it three times, but once we released Unending Quill of Bahamut, and the reaction that we got from everybody was, generally speaking, if this is going to come out every six months, you're going to kill us. And so it was a very sort of rough world race, and I'm sure um, a lot of players were very tired um, uh, and sort of exhausted um, when it first released, and people were saying that it would be very, very tough on us to have it come every two major patch updates. And, and the development team felt the same. So at that time, they decided that, okay, so I think we're not going to do the one that was initially planned for patch 4.5, but instead sort of reach a conclusion at um, 4.3. But then once we made that decision and once that second ultimate battle came out, people apparently got a little bit more energized and they were actually expecting for, oh, what's the next one going to yeah, be at 4.5? Yeah. There were feedback um, asking for us to bring back um, ultimate content at 4.5. But the dev team, the development team, actually felt fortunate that we decided to cancel the ultimate content that was planned for 4.5 because um, we were also developing for Vault Nessian Arsenal and, of course, continuing work on Shadowbringers. And so had those been been going on in parallel to the development of ultimate battle content at 4.5 they were worried that either the quality of the ultimate battle at 4.5 would have significantly dropped or they may have had to decide to cancel Valdesian Ar Arsenal so it was good that we didn't have it with all of those results we are still discussing about how do we take the ultimate series in the 5.x patch updates and i think it's looking like we definitely want to do it twice it's almost decided that we will definitely have it twice and then if whether or not we do a third one is sort of pending to see um, how we do in the first two of course, some of the dev team members want to do a third one, but then the other part of the dev team mentioned that, but if we were to do another ultimate content, we'll, we're going to be doing work on our next expansion. That's, that's impossible. So the discussion is still ongoing on that matter, and we don't want to also put too much of a burden on our development team to the point where they're struggling to get the content created. And we also don't want to drop in quality either we want to always give it our best and so um and there's also other content to develop um, for the next expansion or other relevant content so we will first focus on our first ultimate encounter and then we're hoping that we can reveal more information once we sort of solidify things and once things get decided um, but one more thing that we wanted to bring to your attention is that it is very few and far between that you have a creator that can make battle content, encounter content at that level, um, even looking at developers around the world. And in, on the 14 team also, there's only about three people who can create content like that. So. My next question may be make it a very light question this okay. time. Um, <laughs> One thing that hasn't received very many updates and people are curious about is Chocobo Racing. Uh -huh. <laughs> Do we expect anything in Shadowbringers to add on to new maps or anything additional to Chocobo Racing? 
So, of course, with content such as Chocobo Racing, there are team members on the development team mentioning about, yeah, it would be nice we can if we can update it soon. But with Gold Saucer, and of course, we also mentioned about PvP, but new content and updates are planned for patch 5.1, only because when an expansion is released, and I'm sure you got the gist of what he was saying, but players will rush to get the main scenario quests done, um, they need to level their main job, they need to level their alt jobs, they need to level their disciples of the hand and land crafting and gathering, and then jump into the raid, and that's kind of the general flow that we've been observing, and nobody's going to go to Gold Saucer. <laughs> so that's why we want to sort of have them focus on the content at launch, and then we have the updates coming in the first major patch update. But again, just to reiterate, there is the sentiment amongst the development team to want to upgrade uh, elements, not specifically to chocobo racing, but um, there is that desire to sort of update things for our players. Um, there's one issue though, the person who works on the chocobo racing is just one person, and he had actually moved up in the team, and so he's now handling raid content and he's working on those so if we were to have him um, sort of upgrade at chocobo racing we'll have to um, sort of pull him out momentarily and have somebody else handle the development of um, raid content which could be problematic so i think we need to find um, somebody who can take on and sort of pass the torch on to um, before we decide on uh, making updates okay. So with the drop of 32-bit support, I'm wondering if there's anything specific you guys are excited to do with less limitations in the future. Is there anything specific you guys have in mind for that? <laughs> the thing about Windows 32-bit OS is that it's just there's so little memory to process things, and that was literally the biggest issue. And, and the development team is surprised that 14 can run on Windows 32-bit OS, and it, it's a miracle that it's even functioning properly. And so I think the biggest advantage of um, dropping the support is just it alleviates a lot of debug cost on the team's end. Yeah. And so in terms of dropping support, it will allow us to be able to manage more things, um, be able to render more things um, at the same time. And I think that's where we will be seeing that sort of breaking free of that limitation of that 32-bit OS. So for example, um, if you are uh, utilizing housing, we, we don't have to worry about accommodating for 32-bit OS. And so the range at which things are rendered is expanded. So you'll be able to see more things rendered or in RAID content, it will allow for us to depict more sort of artistic sort of visual presentation on screen. So I think those would be the elements that might be uh, more easily recognizable with okay. the sort of upgrade. So with the improvement of sort of visual rendering, you might think that, well, what about character graphics? Um, and um, unfortunately, character graphics quality will not dramatically change. Um, that is more uh, associated with the graphics engine, and we would have to rebuild the graphics engine in order for the character models to become improved in the visual quality. But considering if we were to um, rebuild, redesign our graphics engine, we would have to look at all the resources we already have, and, and it's, it's a mess right now. Uh -huh. And so we need to reorganize it. And, and so at this point, we're like, um, I think we want to release Shadowbringers first, and I think we'll come back to that later. Okay. Again, speaking with a lot of high-end players, mm -hmm. they often want new challenges. They want something more difficult to do. And every day, they say, what about four-man? Difficult content. <laughs> um, and so I guess I could mix this between two questions. Do we think that we'll start having smaller challenges for higher tier players like four man dungeons? Or is there going to be some way to bring back old content and find ways to make it challenging to use the same assets you already have to maybe reduce development? So the answer is going to be broken down into several different points. But first of all, when asked, do we make considerations for these kind of high-end content? Um, for example, you mentioned about four-man challenges. It's actually always being considered, like there is always a discussion about, so what do we do? Do we want to do a, a very 
challenging or difficult content that can be attempted by four people. And so we are constantly trying to make considerations. And uh, of course, Yoshida being one of those people that come up with ideas for different content material. Whenever we're thinking about super difficult content that you attempt with four people, you have to be careful because not one person can be like, gone or else if they um, are knocked out or incapacitated, it's going to throw things off and it's a very peaky sort of way uh, um, content that we'd have to adjust and I'm sure if um, either of you are familiar with game designing or game developing it it will probably ring a bell and two issues that would uh, come about how many people will actually attempt something that is so difficult and of course if we want as many people as possible trying to attempt and complete this content we need to have that sort of incentive or, or some kind of reward and if this reward is something that is very powerful um, those more casual players might not like that fact but having that sort of difficulty and the peaky balance but still able to complete and clear the content and trying to consider all the factors that go into creating such content would require enough development resources to create say like an ultimate content and so, of course, you mentioned about utilizing graphics, resources, assets, and repurposing them. Sure, that isn't a factor that would decrease the, the burden on the development resources, but we still have to come up with the mechanics and the different gimmicks that are part of that battle uh, encounter, and our designer would have to come up with ideas from scratch. The same goes for programming of the content. We would have to write the code from scratch as well, so unfortunately it's not just a matter of repurposing what existing content we already have. And so. If we were faced with the decision of whether we utilize one of our um, very talented designers to create content that is for man and extremely difficult, or risk sacrificing the quality of some other content, the development team usually ends up deciding that it's more efficient to create ultimate battle. That's how the conversation tends to, to go. And the other issue that arises the job balance. Of course, in a light party, you have your one tank, two DPS, one healer, and it's because because there's such a small number of people going into the content, it's inevitable to start seeing that certain combinations of job going into the content is more advantageous than the other. Uh, you can see it much more significantly compared to that of an eight-man content. Um, and then on top of that, amongst the four people, there may be specific action of a specific job that might make things more advantageous and people might find that you need to need to have this job and make sure that you have this action available and there's a really high chance of that happening so with any sort of raid or difficult content the typical way to go about balancing the content is the assumption of eight people going into it so if we were to have that in a reduced sort of member number of people going into the content it causes that kind of issue with not just the balance but people asking for, um, well, I want the, this job balanced because of such content. And there's that sort of fear of the feedback that comes back that way. So we always discuss it very heavily about it. And we always tend to, to be like, well, we need to um, give it more thought. And, and you know, it's, we're always kind of wondering and, and hesitant on it. And of course, there are other team members in the development team that do want to respond to that request. Um, there are people who want to sort of create content like that, that would satisfy that sort of. But when Yoshida poses that question of, would you rather create high-end, super difficult content for four people, like a savage content for four people, or have your next Valdesian arsenal? <laughs> a lot of the team members would want to go and create, help create the second Valdesian arsenal, so. But don't lose hope. Please don't lose hope. Oh, uh, I guess short and sweet is what are you looking forward to the most for the community to experience in Shadowbringers? With Final Fantasy XIV, of course we are one of the titles within the Final Fantasy franchise and we are very proud of creating content and a game that is under that banner. With Shadowbringers, the main story really brings together a lot of the elements that Yoshida and team wanted to relay to our players in Final Fantasy XIV. A lot of elements that we wanted to sort of deliver to our, our players and then sort of packed it all in. And so we will be touching upon the core part of 
story of Final Fantasy XIV. There's probably going to be an immense amount of shock that you will experience through the story. Um, some of it will be very impactful. With six years history of Final Fantasy XIV at this point, uh, many different content that the players have been experiencing through Final Fantasy XIV will be sort of connected to some of the elements in Shadowbringers, and you'll see the link between some of the story that is behind the content that you've played through. And so we would really love for the community to enjoy the main scenario, the main story. Take your time to immerse yourself into it and enjoy it. Personally speaking, Yoshida feels that between the narratives of A Realm Reborn Heavensward and Stormblood, Shadowbringers is probably the best in terms of quality of the story, and he feels that it would be such a waste for anybody to skip over the story. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.